do you think of when you hear the word treasure? What goes through your mind? Maybe it's lost treasure. Maybe it's treasure island. Um, it, it might be buried treasure, possibly. What goes through your mind when you think of the word treasure? I know for me, when, when I was young, which I don't have quite the stories that Paul has, but I do have a few stories because I was, I was pretty mischievous as a boy growing up, as most boys can be. Uh, my grandfather owned a farm uh, that had a river that ran through it, and there was a lot of fields in that area, but there were some wooded areas as well. In the northeast corner of Arkansas, where I grew up, um, they call it the foothills of the Ozarks. And so, uh, uh, you know, when you go west uh, from the little town of Pocahontas, you kind of start going up into the hills. That's where my grandfather's farm was. And so I did a lot of hunting there and a lot of playing, jumping over hay bales, things like that, you know, that, that boys tend to do. And one of the things that I love to do most uh, at his farm, there was a cabin there, and we would always have uh, our Thanksgiving or our Christmas there. So all the family was gathered, and it was one of the two. I can't remember now which. But we were all there, and I decided that after we ate, I was going to go out and explore. That was one of my favorite things to do, just explore, see what you could find. And so there I am looking around, and on his property, there was one field that was along the river, and it was a pretty good-sized field. And after it would rain, you could go out there and, and look, and you'd find all kinds of arrowheads in that area. So I love to do that, just kind of look around and, and, and see what I could find. Well, as I was exploring that particular day, I came to the, must have been the far corner of his property, and there was a barbed wire fence. You know, barbed wire doesn't keep a young boy out, right? And I knew that's where his property ended, but I could see on the other side of that barbed wire fence this old barn, and it looked like it was just falling apart. I thought, I wonder what's in there. But I, I knew this was not my granddad's property. But I kind of looked around, and I mean, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of nothing. So who's going to catch me, right? So I ease through the barbed wire fence, and I go over to this barn, and I kind of ease the door open, and I walked in slowly. I didn't want it to fall in on me. I must have been 10 or 11 years old when I was doing this. And so I started looking around, and it was all dusty, and there were cobwebs everywhere, and I kept finding little cubby holes back in, in different parts of this old barn. And finally, in the back corner, uh, kind of mashed up in some old hay, there was a chest. The chest was probably this big. You know, it's one of those older chests that had the, the tray in the top, and you, you take it out. And I, I looked at it, and I, I thought about opening it up. And in my mind, I was thinking, I wonder what's inside that. And then I started thinking, this is not my da granddad's land. This is not his barn. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble. But my curiosity continued to drive me. And so I eased on over into that corner. And I, I reached down and I kind of dusted off the top of that old chest. And I thought, when I open this, there's going to be all kinds of gold coins <laughs> and jewels. And I'm going to be rich. I opened it up, and there was just nothing but the top tray and a bunch of dust and cobwebs. I thought, oh, it's empty. Somebody beat me here. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe underneath this there's something. And so I, I lifted out the tray, kind of got it, had to jiggle it a little bit. I finally got it out. And I moved it over, and there were a couple of old rags. You know, these uh, square pieces of cloth that you'd make a, a patchwork quilt out of. There were several of those, and it, the, the, the fabric was kind of rotting, you know, and you could tell it had been there a long time. But then over into the right, there was a stack of something. And I started looking through it, and it was baseball cards. And I'm not talking about... 1986 tops baseball cards. I'm talking about the kind that were like that narrow and that tall. I'm talking old baseball cards. They were probably not worth anything because they were so old and beat up. But that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. I mean, I'd heard about those old baseball cards that were the different shape that were worth thousands. And I started thinking... 
I wonder what these are worth. <laughs> Maybe the treasure inside this chest is not gold, but maybe it's baseball cards. And so you can imagine the temptation that came over me. Well, nobody's out here. This chest has been here for years. Surely no one's going to miss these baseball cards. I was, I was an avid collector of baseball cards. And so I started thinking to myself, should I take these? Now, I told that story to Winsong congregation, and in the middle of that sermon that I was telling that story, I completely forgot to tell them. I didn't take the cards, okay? <laughs> Apparently, that's the only thing they were thinking about for the rest of the sermon, <laughs> was that he was a thief. He took the cards, you know? I didn't take the cards, okay? Because I thought, you know, if I bring these back, I will never be able to sell them because I would have had to have had my dad help me with that. I would, I would feel guilty. And I might get my granddad in some pretty deep trouble. And so I just left him and put the tray back, closed the chest, and walked away. And to this day, I still don't know what happened to that chest. But... There was a man whose brother bought that field that my granddad owned and bought the property next to it, the property that this barn was on. He is now a member at Winsong. And he and I were talking about this. And he said, my, my brother bought that. He said, but when he bought it, which was only a couple of years ago, he said there wasn't a barn there. And so at some point, it must have been torn down. What do you think of when you think of treasure? For me... Thinking about treasure and, and a treasure chest like this, my mind goes back to that because that was a real event for me. And I, I looked at it and I remembered thinking, there's got to be something that's worth a lot of money in there. Uh, you know, that's what this is. And, and so opening it up, seeing those cards, and now, much later, I'm wondering, man, what must that have been worth? You think about treasure. Um, some people think of, whoop, did I do that? I hit the arrow. There, oh, there we go. Yes. Some people think of the Goonies. How many of y'all have seen this movie? Please. Yes. All right. Great. Yeah, the Goonies. This may have been my favorite movie growing up. Uh, the Goonies is uh, set in Astoria, uh, Oregon. And uh, in Astoria, uh, you know, you see the scene. What, what, what happened here was that they were going to lose their homes. Uh, there was going to be a country club or whatever, however the story goes, that was going to be built on the, the property where their homes were. Um, and so they were foreclosing on all of their homes. Uh, we actually have a, uh, a young man who is a member at Winsong that's from Astoria. That's his claim to fame, the Goonies. Who would have thought? Uh, but the Goonies are this group of teenagers who are trying to beat the Fratellis, this mother and her two sons that are outlaws. They're trying to beat them to uh, the treasure of the great pirate One-Eyed Willie. Uh, and so through a lot of challenges and great adventure, they end up escaping with their lives and, and a bag full of precious gemstones. And they save the day. Man, that's, isn't that a great movie? I mean, it's a great story. And so you see this idea of treasure. Some people think of it in this way. One writer said, when was the last time that you stopped and evaluated your life? He was asking the question of really stopping and looking at what is most important to us. When was the last time that you did that? The sad truth is most of us don't do that. We just go uh, from day to day you know, doing the things that we do from one day to the next. The truth is, we have to choose what's most important to us. And that choice is often made not verbally, but in the things that we do. Proverbs 17, verse 24 says, An intelligent man aims at wise actions, but a fool starts off in many directions. You know, if that's our gauge of how we're going to evaluate what's most important in our lives, the sad truth is many people are going to fall into the category of fools. None of us wants to live as fools, though. 
We don't want to be foolish in life. We want to be wise in the way that we interact with other people. And so in order to be wise, we know that we have to follow the words of Jesus and understand what he meant when he said the most important things are to love God and to love others. And so in evaluating our priorities and what's most important to us, I think this has to be the measuring stick. Am I fulfilling what God has called me to? And so we have to choose. God doesn't decide for us what priorities we're going to have in life. And I think we all know that. In fact, Job said that we can choose what sounds to listen to, what tastes in food that we like the most. But we have to define what's right for us, what's good for us. We have to decide what those priorities are in our life. And so we think about things that are good. And we have to ask ourselves questions like, what's good in my family? What's good in my personal life? What's good at work? Those are how we determine what's most important to us. Those things that we really focus on from day to day. And I know you understand that. Let's go to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. And much like... No, it's not... Maybe I'm pushing the wrong button. There you go. Yeah, if you don't mind, just hit it. Thank you. Yeah, Matthew 6. Um, much like Wes said earlier, you know, we're going we're gonna to get to the uh, do not lay up treasures for yourselves. Okay, we're going to get there. I want you to know that. But we have to understand what's happening and what Jesus is saying here. And so Matthew chapter 6, uh, there's something that happens at the beginning that I think uh, weighs heavily on our understanding of what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19-24. And so here's the way he starts out. Verse 1, beware. I'm reading from the ESV. Beware, he says, of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. All right, that very opening word that he gives to us there uh, is beware. Uh, prosekete is the name, or is the Greek word of that word we have translated for us, beware. It's an imperative. It's a command. And, and essentially what Jesus is saying here is beware of doing the right things for the wrong reasons. That's what he's getting at through this whole thing. And so he helps us to see that principle in three different ways. In the way that we give, in the way that we pray, in the way that we fast. So that's where that's a progression that he goes through in the first 18 verses. The question that we have to ask ourselves in this is, do I want the approval of God or do I want the approval of others? That's the context in which Jesus is now saying in verse 19 through 24, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And so all of this, as Jesus is explaining in the beginning portion here about how we are to give, pray, and fast, Jesus is setting us up to see what he's going to say in the heart of chapter 6. And so if you look at the next section, 19 down through 24, you're going to see Jesus saying these words, very familiar to us, but let's read this section together. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if the eye is healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As Jesus is saying this, we have to ask ourselves, how do we determine where or what our treasure is? You know, our treasure is more determined by what we do than by what we say. It's easy for us to say what's important to us, but what we do shows what's really important to us. I think we have to realize that being a Christian is not about us. 
Being a Christian is all about God. Some people today would argue that Christianity is all about us, that everything revolves around us and our happiness. Uh, Some would even suggest that our gathering for worship isn't really about God, it's about us. Uh, A few years ago, the wife of a popular televangelist said these words during a worship assembly. I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. But we're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. And when you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Look at that line, that that line again on that next slide. When you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God, really. A lot of people in our world, and sadly even a lot of people within the church, would hold this similar view. The sad reality is that many people today have reached a point in their lives where the only thing that matters to them is their happiness. And they've so convinced themselves that God wants them to be happy that they will pretty much throw out everything that Scripture teaches us is the way that we ought to live. And they'll say, well, as long as I'm happy, that's really what God wants. And so they conclude, since God wants me to be happy, then I'm just going to do whatever makes me happy, whatever satisfies me. And that affects every other aspect of their life. It affects your career, your interactions with your coworkers. It, it, it impacts uh, your relationships at church, within your families, and your marriage particularly. And that's why I think we see so many marriage problems today broken marriages because someone said, well, I'm not happy in this marriage anymore. God really just wants me to be happy, so surely this is okay. Ultimately, it all comes down to the question of our treasure. And so if you look back at the beginning of this section, verse 19, there's two imperatives in in this beginning section, 19 down through 21. These two imperatives... Uh, The first one is, do not lay up. Okay, do not lay up. Um, This is coming from a Greek word that is used twice here, and really in the Greek, this is a pun. And so Jesus is playing on this word, treasure. And so very literally, what Jesus is saying here is, stop treasuring up treasures. Stop treasuring up treasures, or stop hoarding hoards. Okay, so the next imperative that we see is but lay up okay and that's verse 20 treasure up we would say and so literally Jesus again using this same word he would say start treasuring up treasures or start hoarding hoards in heaven not on earth so again this passage is I know very familiar to us but I want us to think about what's actually happening here Jesus is telling these people his disciples that what they need to be concerned about is things that are eternal. And that's a problem for us. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about your possessions. I want you to think about maybe the plan that you have long term in your life. Is there anything wrong with investing? Certainly not. And and we know that. Uh, Because Jesus teaches that parable where uh, the man comes and he says, okay, here, I'm going to give you five, I'm going to give you two, I'm going to give you one. And he goes away. And what happens when he comes back? Uh, The five-talent man said, here, I've made five more. Uh, The two-talent man, here, I've made two more. And the one-talent man said, hey, look, I knew you were harsh. Uh, And so I didn't want to lose what you gave me, so I just buried it. Uh, not like the mud puppies, but you know, I just buried it and I, you know, dug, I dug that back up and here you go, I'm just going to give it back to you. And, and you all know that story, but the reality is within that story, Jesus is saying, listen, you need to invest. You need to do something with what God has given to you. 
Okay? So it's not wrong to invest. That's not what Jesus is saying. It's much like what Wes was saying a minute ago. Jesus is not telling them that it's wrong to do this. But what Jesus is telling them is you need to make sure where your heart is, where your focus is. So think about your life. Think about your possessions. Are you clinging to them? Maybe not in an overt way, but do you put your trust in them? That's what Jesus is getting at here. Don't treasure up treasures here. Realize that these things are not going to last. There's some misconceptions with uh, this particular uh, discussion, particularly with money. Um, Some misconceptions, one of them is that poverty is a kind of spirituality. So I just need to be poor. I need to give away everything I have and just live uh, in, in a very poor state, and somehow that's going to make me more spiritual. Another misconception is that money is going to bring me happiness. These are all well known to you, but I want you to think through them. Another misconception is that to be wealthy is a sin. Certainly we know that's not true. Uh, another misconception, maybe not misconception, but a misquote, is that money is the root of all evil. That's not what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. He says the love of of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And then notice this. We always stop there, but here's what he says in verse 10 of 1 Timothy 6. He says, It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. What craving? The craving for money, possessions. And so the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So what about treasures laid up on earth? Jesus is not teaching that we need to avoid work or or refrain from providing for our families. We we know these things. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 10, anyone who does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his own household, uh, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it would be better for you to be an unbeliever than it would be for you to be a believer and not provide for your family. So Jesus isn't talking about that. Um, Treasures laid up in heaven. Well, these treasures that are laid up in heaven are lasting, and that's really the heart of what he's getting at. That They're lasting. They can't rust. They can't be stolen. Because you lay them up at the feet of God. I love what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12 as he's challenging the people. It's verse 15 where he says, take care, very similar word that what we have at the beginning of chapter 6 of beware, but take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now I wonder if it's important enough for Jesus to say those words to the people Don't you think it's important enough for us to to give them a little bit more thought? That our lives don't consist in the abundance of the things that we have. But isn't that the way we live? I mean, let's be honest. Don't we live that way? Man, if I could just get more, if I could just get that promotion, if I could just have a little bit more money, maybe then we could do this, and then maybe uh, we could spend more family time together. And we start justifying our our desire for more. Maybe it's going to create a better atmosphere for our family if we could just do this or do that. And you can see how quickly our focus begins to spiral out of control. And Jesus says, listen, you need to remember. You need to take care. You need to be aware. that That's not what a person's life consists of. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus then what Jesus is calling us to is something that's completely different than what the world says. And I know we say that all the time. We hear that all the time, that that phrase that it's different than what the world says. Yes, it's a radical lifestyle. But he's saying you need to treasure up treasures in heaven because that's the place that's eternal. That's the place that a thief is not going to break in and steal. Rust is not going to destroy these treasures. But yet, we live in a way that, man, all of our hope, all of our trust, all of our efforts 
at times seem to be in the here and now. The treasures reveal our heart. And we end up doing what's most important to us. As I said earlier, our priorities reveal our heart. Those things that we do, that shows what's really important to us. But then he goes into this section in verses 22 down through 23, talking about the eye and the lamp, the body and light and darkness. And what's he saying here? Look, look at it again. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. What does that mean? What's a lamp? Very, very easy. It's a light, okay? What do you use a light for? Be able to see, right? This is very easy, y'all. Okay? <laughs> you have to be able to see. Yeah. So the eye is the lamp for the body. My eye, my focus, okay? Think about that word. My focus is what guides my body. Okay? So the eye, he says, is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, well, your whole body will be full of light. Now, I know you know this, but in the New Testament, you see light and darkness being used symbolically in so many different ways, but particularly with regard to spiritual health. Uh, and in this particular context, that's exactly what Jesus is meaning. If your eye is healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. We're going to be focused on the right thing. We're going to be heading in the right direction, right? But then he says, if your eye is bad, if it's unhealthy, then your whole body will be full of darkness. And this is not, uh, as Ralph Gilmore says, this is not rocket surgery, okay? So you come to understand the reality that Jesus is trying to get us to see the eternal from the eternal perspective, which is drastically different than the way we live, and so, if your eye's bad, your whole body's going to be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That's not a question, that's a statement. My grandmother, uh, she passed away several years ago, but she had an aneurysm while she was vis visiting family out in California. And that aneurysm uh, left her laying on their patio that whole day while they were gone to work. They got home in the afternoon and they found her laying there. Uh, she spent two weeks in the hospital out in California. Uh, they flew her back here. She spent more time in the hospital back in, I say here, back in uh, Arkansas. Spent more time. And, and finally, she was able to, to live her life as normally as she could. But the thing that happened to her during that first aneurysm that she had was that it affected her eyesight. She had, she had trouble even reading, had trouble even seeing. So, like, if she was going to write down someone's phone number, uh, she would write letters. I'm not kidding. They were that big on the, on the piece of paper, I mean, so that, she could, so that she could see. And I used to go to her house for lunch uh, almost every day. Uh, this is when I was in, in college. I, I would go and, and have lunch with her. She would make me lunch every day. And I would sit there and talk to her. And we had a lot of great conversations. And she would always talk about how she couldn't see. And it was almost every day. Son, I hope, I hope the corn is good. I couldn't really see what I was putting into it. But I hope it's good. And it was. It was delicious. Maybe some of the best aside, aside from Lindsay's corn. Um, Okay, so it was probably, I mean, it was really good corn, uh, and, and she always did it right, but it was always her concern. I couldn't see, I can't see. My grandmother was an excellent cook, I mean, excellent cook, and after that aneurysm and her not being able to see very well, she kind of stopped cooking the way that she used to. There were a few staples, like her corn, uh, like her uh, yeast rolls. She could still do those. Um, but for the most part, she stopped. And she would always say something about her food to me. I hope that it tastes okay. And I think about her when I read this, and I think about our focus. God has given us spiritual eyes to focus in on the blessings that He wants to shower upon us. And those blessings that He showers upon us, sometimes we take them for granted. 
Other times we put them to use for selfish reasons. And Jesus here is saying, have your eyes open to things that are eternal. The thing that we did last night, uh, the collection, that's something eternal. That's something eternal. And I want you to think about what it means. For a lot of us, we put a little bit into the plate, and we were told this morning how much was collected. That's a tremendous amount, and it's going to go to help a lot of people. And what Jesus is saying here is, Don't not do the work of God because you want more. When our focus is on wanting more, then our whole body is full of darkness. We can't see. And so, I think a question for us individually is, can I see clearly today? 2 Peter chapter 1 Verse 9, Peter writes, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. I'm I'm nearsighted, so uh, I don't really, I've never really figured out the difference necessarily between nearsighted and farsighted. Is it when you're farsighted, you can see things far away? It's that easy, Neil. Is it? Okay. I'm done. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. So you can see things far away, but up close. All right, is it far sighted folks that need bifocals? Or is it, am I wrong on that? Everybody needs bifocals. Okay. <laughs> Paul, you want to finish this? <laughs> I'm nearsighted. And so, can y'all, I feel like Paul, see with what letter, big letters I write? Uh, so I'm, I still use paper uh, for my outlines, but I have to use such large font because when I'm standing up, if it were 12 point font, I wouldn't be able to read a word of it to remind myself of what I want to say. Being nearsighted, and this is all about our focus And Peter, again, whoever lacks these qualities, and he's talking about the way that we live, thinking in terms of the heavenly perspective, the way that we live, not focusing on here and now, but rather understanding what God is calling us to as followers of Jesus. If we're we're lacking these things, we're nearsighted. We're, We're like blind people who are forgetting the fact that we were once cleansed from our former sins. And I think so often we live as though we are so nearsighted and blind because we've forgotten the reality that this world is not our home. We are so, so bent on getting more here and now. And Jesus says we can't serve two masters. We can only serve one God. Um, Some versions have the word mammon. Uh, I know most of you are familiar with the word mammon. It's the Aramaic word, which means wealth or money uh, or material riches. Satan, Satan doesn't demand complete allegiance, but God does. I want you to think about it in this way, this, this context uh, of chapter 6, verses 19 down through 24 here in Matthew. Think about it in terms of four questions that come out of this text. The first one is, how long will it last? So verses 19 and 20, how long is this treasure going to last? That's what Jesus is really getting at. How long is it going to last? Well, if we lay up treasures here on earth, well, moth and rust destroy. Thieves can break in and steal. But the converse of that is, if you lay up treasures in heaven then moth and rust can't destroy. Thieves can't break in. How long is it going to last? So when you think about um, investing in something, whatever it is, how long is it going to last? I'm telling you the work that was done last night by the assembly in taking up that collection, that's going to affect people for a long time. Second question that comes out of this is where are we investing our time and our money? Where are we investing our time and money? Is it in things that matter to me, things that are going to make me feel good, things that are going to 
things that are going to give me maybe very quick gratification? Or I'm, am I investing in helping those that are poor, those that are weak? Third question that comes out of this, verses 22 and, and 23 Where's your focus? This deals with the eye again. Where's your focus at today? And finally, whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? Jesus ends this section, really the whole chapter, I think, deals with the similar concept. Um, do we want the praise of men or the praise of God? Now, are we seeking to be a, a, you know, gain approval of of others or of God. That's what Jesus is asking in the very beginning. And he goes through uh, the, the three groups. You know, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Oh yeah, and don't store up treasures here on earth. Store up treasures in heaven, those things that are eternal. And think about, think about what God does for you. Don't be anxious, verse 25. Don't be anxious, but recognize what God does for you. And so verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Think about that quote again that I shared earlier. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you go to church, when you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God really, you're doing it for yourself. In response to that statement that was made, Bible professor and author David Wallace, he said this, How we treat one another, how we honor God, what our understanding of and commitment to the gospel is, and how we measure true success all need a serious overhaul. The root problem seems to be twofold. The marginalization of the Word of God and the buddyization of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about the religious climate that we're living in today. Think about where people are putting their trust, and their hope. Think about how the gospel, uh, and maybe not just the small parts of the gospel, but I'm talking about as a whole. I want you to think about how that seems to be shifting in what's being taught and put forward. Not just outside the churches of Christ, but even now within the churches of Christ. The marginalization of the Word of God. We have brothers and sisters within the church that are telling their congregations that if Jesus didn't specifically say it, then we really don't have to follow that. That if, if Paul said it, well, Paul was speaking to a specific culture in a specific time. And if he were to come here today and talk to us, he'd probably say something different because we live in a different culture and a different time. I think we need to take seriously the words of Jesus. And when, he, when we see the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, and just the, the teachings of Jesus as a whole, we need to understand that others throughout the New Testament, Paul in particular said, you know, these words that I'm speaking to you, they're not mine, they're the Lord's. Christianity is not about us. It's all about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. So what can we do to stay focused? Real quick, and then we'll close. What can we do to stay focused on what really matters? First thing I think we can do is cultivate a deep relationship with Jesus. I know that sounds so simple, but it takes a lot of work, especially for people who've been in the church for a long time. I'm 43, I've been a Christian for quite some time, since I was 15 years old. And I can speak just from my experience that it takes work to continue developing that relationship with Jesus. It's not a one-time thing. And I know we all know that. But let's think about it critically and challenge ourselves to dig deeper and develop a deeper relationship with Jesus. John 15, verse 5 and 6, there Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him... He it is who bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing, he says. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like, like a branch and he withers. The branches are gathered and they're thrown into the fire and burned. 
We need to stay connected to Him, continue to cultivate that relationship with Him. Second thing we can do is give ourselves in service to others. And we live in such a self-centered world. We think about ourselves all the time. We think about what's in this for me. We, we, we see some new uh, venture, maybe it's at, at work, maybe it's even within the church, some new ministry. Yeah, but what am I going to get out of this? And we're so concerned with ourselves. Philippians chapter 2, a very familiar passage to you, beginning at verse 5 there where Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He says, who, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but He emptied Himself. Now, picture in your minds, Paul saying this of Jesus. Here, Jesus is not seeing that being equal with God is something to hang on to. And what do we do with what we have, our possessions? So often, man, we just cling to them, don't we? And Jesus, the Son of God, did not consider being equal with God something to hang on to, but He let go of that, emptied Himself. Gnosis. He emptied himself and he became a servant. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the what? Author and perfecter of our faith. Or ESV says, founder and perfecter of our faith. And notice this, who for the, you know the next word? Joy. Joy set before him did what? Endured the cross, despising its shame. Giving ourselves in service to others. Let me ask, what about the cross was joy? Here he's talking about how he's the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I'm here to tell you that the joy Jesus found in the cross was from the knowledge of Him serving us. He knew that He was giving Himself for us. That brings joy, and it will to us too. We need to give ourselves in service to others. And so, the third thing, we need to focus on the eternal. Something I've already said today, but I want us to think about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 down through 18. There Paul says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that far exceeds those things that we experience here. He's saying it's far outweighing this. And, and then he says, we look not to the things that are seen, to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's where our focus needs to be. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. Rather than do and be what the world is saying and doing, we need to follow His instruction. Something that's completely different. And that is, quit hoarding hoards. Quit treasuring up treasures here. Make sure that we're devoting those blessings that God has given to us to furthering the kingdom, storing up those treasures in heaven. Thank you. Thank you. I admire you so much. I hope Thank you. you know that. Thank you. Uh, the feeling is you know when, uh, mutual. I hope when you the know girls that. were little, they'd say, do we only go places where you're preaching? And Patsy said, answer them. Well, I, that's all I did. And I've been watching you through the years. And you blessing your family, whether you're on the program or not, you're the man. Thank and you. That's great. Thank you. Neil, good, good to man. see you. Thanks. Great yes, job. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks for being here. Well, grab that and take it and turn it off. Okay. Like a magician. <laughs> he he pulled a star out. <laughs> pulling a rabbit out. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. There you go. Thank you. I want to say I enjoyed it. Thank you. It's nice to see another box. All right.